Hey all, welcome to another episode of Film Recommendations. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the uh, thrice-titled Birds of Prey. I say thrice-titled because at one point it was just Birds of Prey, at another it was Harley Quinn Birds of Prey, or Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey, um, and uh, eventually it was changed to Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Well, this one was remarkably fun. Uh, it didn't take itself too seriously, but it did suffer from some of the same problems as, um, well, Suicide Squad, which it is considered a sequel to. Um, it's kind of the last gasp of the... Um, of the uh, DC Cinematic Universe, as it were, and it had some things going for it, and and I do have to be honest about that. It passed the Bechdel test. You have um, scenes where women are conversing about stuff where it does not concern a man. Um, you know, there are just other aspects like that. Um, one of the troubling aspects to it uh, when I mentioned Suicide Squad is that it is told out of order. A lot of stuff is just taken and they go, okay, hold on, before we proceed any further, let me go back and explain all of this stuff that happened earlier instead of just telling the story in order. And uh, right now I'm, uh, if you've been following the channel uh, you'll know that I've been reading uh, for uh, your enjoyment, the novelization of the third Resident Evil film, Resident Evil Extinction, which has a habit of going back and forth. Now, you can do that in a novel because the person reading it is reading it. You can go back and read just the before chapters and then just the after chapters in their own order, uh, respectively. It's literally odd, even, odd, even. You could sit there with tabs and mark them out and just read the ones that are in a certain order and then go to the next one. But with a movie, you have to kind of make sure you're keeping the audience in step with where you're going as a storyteller. So constantly jumping back and forth in time like that for when something is happening doesn't always work. They do try and give you as much framing as possible so that if something happened at the same place as another thing that we've already seen, then we can kind of follow along. Oh, okay, at the same time that this was happening, this other thing was happening. That works, and uh, that's done for a couple of things that we do see. But some of the other uh, aspects you'll get occasional freeze frames and text popping up, just like in Suicide Squad. Yeah, just like with that little um, sort of baseball card graphic that they would do with some little flashy thing showing that, like, um, Captain Boomerang likes uh, little plush unicorns or something like that. Things like that are problematic. In this, they reduce a lot of that down to just a couple of things, so you aren't having to get confused by the freeze frame, the flash of text up there for a second. You can get used to processing just a little blurb of just a few words. But getting past that, the casting is excellent. Uh, Margot Robbie uh, plays Harley Quinn, but... In a really interesting point, they got uh, Rosie Perez to play Montoya, and I think that was an excellent bit of casting just on the part of the filmmakers, because Perez, for those who don't know uh, who I'm talking about, Perez made a bit of a name for herself back in the 90s. She was a more petite Latina who um, was able to do a lot of versatile roles. She was able to be in your face. She was able to be sweet. She was able to play up to characters um, that were a little bit more prototypical, but then also play characters with depth. She had a bit of a range. And in this one, they really let her play the part. They don't 
tell her, okay, now put some salsa in it or something uh, god awful like that. They they actually let her act, and um, I found that really good. Um, it it does have a little bit more to say to it than Joker, I think does, and takes you on a bit more of a fun journey. Whereas Joker is more of a tragedy. Uh, he's not a happy character. He doesn't do well. He isn't satisfied. And by direct contrast, you have Birds of Prey, Harley Quinn, whatever you want to call it. And you do get satisfied by the end. You do feel like there's a bit of a change in a story arc whereby the person came to a better self-realization. With that said, it isn't hard to sit through. There's only one part where I actually didn't... um, Well, two parts where I didn't enjoy myself. This film's rated R, so... The one part where I didn't enjoy myself was an extremely gory scene uh, where they didn't linger on it too long, but it was extremely gross. Um, But the other scene, you have to get a bit of a preface for. Uh, In this film, the main villain is Roman Sionis, which for fans of the Batman comic book series, you'll know that Roman Sionis is Black Mask. This is the first real portrayal we've had of Black Mask, on screen prior to this we had false face but since black mask was such a darker character and his role really came into fruition um around a certain point where um where the comic books kept getting darker and grittier um black mask was uh really an interesting opposite number to batman Whereas Batman worked mostly alone and had really tried to develop himself into uh, his best possible self in order to fight crime, uh, Sionis had been ousted from his family uh, and had used his connections and ties and finances to build a criminal empire, where basically then uh, he was feeding into the criminal element uh, that Bruce was trying to fight that resulted in Bruce losing his parents in the first place. Uh, Sionis, of course, kept up this um, face of, you know, the handsome young, uh, you know, heir to the Sionis family fortune. Uh, But in the context of the film, he's been cut off from those funds and just things that are in his legal name are... uh, are his. So that mostly just includes a uh, club that he retrofitted in an old warehouse that he also lives in an apartment above. So he's doing okay, but not great. Um, His club is not, you know, huge or expansive or anything like that. It's pretty well uh, figured that it's built on a set or something like that. Speaking of which, there's a lot of location filming, but it seems to clearly be done in L.A., and this is supposed to be Gotham. Gotham is an East Coast city, and they do try and do a certain number of shots that uh, make it look and feel a bit more like some parts are really old and decrepit. But then they film in these locations in the, that are pretty clearly in Los Angeles, and that just doesn't mesh well. You have these settings where, um, like Amusement Mile is where the climax happens that I'm getting to with all of this, and it doesn't quite work so well. At that point, uh, Sionis has Harley and um, Huntress and some of the others cornered at uh, this old fun house called the Booby Trap, and he sends an army of men and he actually says men of Gotham. Now you'll forgive me if this just kind of sets me off because, um, partially because I'm non-binary, but, uh, they, they make it all entirely. Oh, the men are coming to get the women and it's just a group of a handful of women and they're fighting off all these big, strong men. And it's like, you know what? I don't, I don't care about that. You know, you could have had some women in the group for all we care about, but instead, 
all of the goons that are sent after Harley and everything are men, which is supposed to somehow make this about um, women's liberation. But women's liberation isn't about beating up men. Um, <laughs> it just isn't. You know, it isn't showing that women can hold their own against men. Uh, that That's just not. And, and that's not me trying to, like, explain or anything like that. But that's just... Actually, look it up sometime. Um, there are great authors out there that can explain all kinds of aspects of, um, of women's liberation. But uh, just, uh, just if we want to take, for example, the idea that uh, okay, uh, if you're a feminist, then uh, you should be okay with uh, with men hitting women as much as you are okay with women hitting men. Or we could not have anyone hitting anyone, which is really what a lot of that is about. It's it, it more espouses, like, maybe we don't need to be violent towards anyone, especially based on their sex. Uh, yeah. And as a non-binary person, that just... That that's my wavelength, cause, yeah, it's not good to hit people. Um, anyway, but uh, this particular interpretation uh, does work because these are bad guys. They're coming to um, get a uh, young woman uh, named Cassandra Kane, and I won't spoil too much of this for you. But uh, there's a MacGuffin. And the MacGuffin actually makes sense. It's not just something that they've decided on. Um, where it's like a random orb or something like that that doesn't necessarily have anything to it. No, this actually is something that plays in a bit with some of the other characters. Um, mostly with Huntress. It's satisfying, if not a little convoluted. Uh, because they could just as easily have it... Um, you know, something else. But instead, they have it be a very certain thing. Um, as it is, I think that the uh, writer, direct, the writers and directors and uh, producers all did a good job on this and actually made it into a satisfying film for a broad swath of the audience. I would not recommend it for kids, obviously, because it does feature gore, violence, um, a lot of cussing, but outside of that, for teens and um, and adults who are okay with something that has you know gore in it, you're gonna you're gonna at least enjoy where the story goes. I do wish that uh, kind of like with uh, Deadpool, which um, this feels like a spiritual sister to Deadpool. I wish that they had been able to make a PG-13 version of this um, where, um, uh, if you haven't seen it, there there is a PG version of Deadpool 2. The PG version is actually as good as the original, which was rated R. Um, it is just as enjoyable. It makes it a little bit more family-friendly uh, while still being 100% loyal to the uh loyal to the product this i wish that there was such a version where they just cut out some of the unnecessary uh gore and uh violence and such but as it is um i do like uh the bit of casting that they did with roman sionis which uh they cast ewan mcgregor and ewan mcgregor is easily in his 40s by now but he plays it up as a much younger person, um, which you kind of enjoy. You you feel like this is a this is an older guy who's still trying to play like he's young, uh, past his prime a bit, and um, he's still trying to live like he had like he had in his carefree years. Um, but he doesn't understand that he really is at rock bottom because he's trying to start up a criminal empire. Um, as it is, I felt like, uh, I felt like overall, a lot of the characters were underdeveloped in terms of, um, Huntress and, um, 
I, Montoya felt at least like a satisfying uh, character. She was well rounded, but they had a, a top notch actress, um, so they were going to bother to give her her scenes and let her play her part. Uh, but aside from that, Margot Robbie did a decent job, but they gave her a lot of screen time for her origin story. They also gave her uh, a lot of voiceover work. Given she's a producer and she can make that call, I still think that it was a little bit of an ego trip on on that level, where they just had her on screen or <clears throat> or uh, voicing over things so much that it just went beyond what was necessary. They dial it back a bit as you're actually following her, but it ends up having kind of uh, what you might call the Slimer effect. If you're familiar with the development of the real Ghostbusters, um, J. Michael Straczynski, who wrote the first couple of seasons and, of course, had written a lot of other amazing stuff um, both before then and after, he wrote the show Bible for this. And one of the things he said was, limit the amount of Slimer that you see. It shouldn't be this, um, you know, a little goes a long way. So um, a little bit of Slimer here and there at one part or another during the show, maybe uh, no more than three or four times per episode should Slimer be even doing something actively, unless the story involves him, and even then dial it back as to how crazy he's acting. Uh, with that, since the story focuses on Harley Quinn as our main protagonist, it does work, but if we're doing this in an ensemble and centering it around each of the characters in their own light, then you need to focus enough on Montoya and Huntress and uh, Black Canary. It works. It can still work that way. So they ended up becoming, unfortunately, second bananas in their own film. But a lot of people were coming to this to sort of see Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn because she stole the show so much in Suicide Squad. I feel like Suicide Squad, if you've seen my reviews, if you saw my uh, first 10 redo of Su Suicide Squad, then you'll know that um, I didn't feel like it was everything that it could have been. Um, even though I actually liked a lot of Suicide Squad. And the whole reason why I did kind of a fan edit of the whole thing, but the first 10 minutes was the most important portion of that. Just working with what was there, I... Uh, it was because I actually liked it. This, I would have actually redone it again. Um, but I wouldn't have done as much with voiceover work. Because um, a lot of it's meant to be comedic. And it just isn't. Um, it, 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 it ends up being less satisfying with Harley's narration. Um, but besides all that. Like, like, should you actually see it? Well, yes, I've already kind of made that plain. Um, but I think the shoving Harley into the front of, uh, into the spotlight, as it were, as the main character didn't help the story as much. Uh, I mentioned the Slimer effect. After uh, some consultants came in and uh, gave advice based on nothing uh, other than their own opinions which were based on very little actual facts they decided to put Slimer in the front of the show where the real Ghostbusters became Slimer and the real Ghostbusters and Slimer got his own uh, cartoon that was more slapstick uh, and more uh, more more like what cartoons are stereotyped as um, for about one or two seasons. And it had the effect of people actually not wanting to watch the show as much because it wasn't as intelligent. You didn't have smart dialogue. You had wacky, goofy, green blob character shoved in the front where everybody's watching that. And they thought that that was what kids and everyone else was tuning in to see. Well, that's kind of the situation here. 
uh, people think that they want to see the wacky Jersey accented Harley Quinn uh, running around beating up boys. And I don't think that's really what um, what uh, the Birds of Prey film, let alone Suicide Squad, should have been about. Uh, it was hard enough watching Suicide Squad given the male gaze aspect, which is just where um, the camera is focused on what um, men would, well, cis hetero men would typically look at. But in this, you don't have that. You, you don't have an emphasis on the male gaze, um, really. You have more of a focus on some other things. Some parts are a little bit unbelievable, but it, it, it just uh, defied my, it, it broke my suspension of disbelief at one point where Harley is trying to roller skate after a car and it's like no i don't care how good a skater you are you are not going to go as fast as a car you know un even if you've got a little boost going into it you're not going to go as fast as a car it's just not happening the wheels are not designed to go that fast the components that counter friction it just wouldn't work uh, but, you know, they had to have that portion. And so help me, Margot Robbie is on skates trying to catch up to a car in one scene. And that car for that scene has got to be going so slow. Given it's like a luxury car that I guess Sionis got from his family, I still feel really, like, at odds with it. But with that said... Most of the scenes are relatively believable. They keep a lot of stuff dialed down, held back for everything else. I do wish that Huntress had actually bothered to wear a mask instead of going just barefaced to um, doing a lot of things in, in the film. But beyond all that, the only other thing that I might wish for is a little bit more buildup around Black Canary. Uh, because by the time you actually get to see her do her signature thing, you've completely forgotten that that's Black Canary. Honestly. Like, I, I really did. You know, it, it, we were introduced to her briefly as that, but then we completely forgot in, in the audience. It's like, Oh, that's right. That's why she's here, so that she can do that at that point in the story to kind of help them do this other thing. And then Huntress turns up shortly thereafter. And in a really ridiculous portion, she uh, this is where Harley's on roller skates trying to catch up to the car. Uh, she tosses Harley a rope to pull from the motorcycle and catch up to the car. So, okay. And she's like, whip me! Which comes from the roller derby thing. We've seen this before. It's established. Okay, we're going to come back to it. So, instead of just, like, turning the corner, which would actually be whipping her, um, as it were, with the rope towards the uh, car she spills out on her bike and wrecks the bike. I'm like, you don't have to wreck the bike. You can just turn really sharply or even turn and stop. It's not necessary for you to wreck your bike. But they just decided because it's like, okay, well then why couldn't Huntress just catch up to the car or pull up alongside the car and shoot Sionis or something like that. And instead they have to have that happen so that it takes Huntress out of the running or something. I don't know. It, it, you can kind of see where the writers were going with one scene after another at the end, stacking one on top of the other until stuff happened. One of the reasons why things happened at Amusement Mile was because that's near Founders Pier in Gotham. Unfortunately, those are the only set pieces that actually look like Gotham because they did all this on location filming and so much of it is during the day 
but because it's in Los Angeles, it looks like California, where it's all sunny. And watching it, seeing people going out, enjoying themselves, while currently living under this lockdown, really makes me feel at odds. But as it is, another aspect to this film that I think is just odd is that it was released in January and February of 2020. Now, those are not when you release your blockbusters. I mean, really. January is known as the dumping ground for uh, a lot of films because by then... Most people have gone to see the big Christmas blockbuster. So this was kind of put out there after years in development and, uh, you know, years of reworking and reshoots and things like that to try and make a final product. And finally they get this out and they put it out at one of the worst possible times. So we end up with, kind of a defunct product at that point it ends up feeling like a summer movie but it's released in the middle of winter and that's really one of the problems with why it feels at odds Um, you've got that weird juxtaposition of location shooting where they just decided to film obviously in los angeles and it just doesn't quite feel right um I'm trying to think of any other city that would have felt better, but it's really hard to do Gotham, you know, but I think that they could have done it like on location in some other areas. Um, and it would have just felt better. Um, I mean, Gotham has to feel dark. It has to feel gritty. It can't feel clean and sunny and warm. It has to be this, this uh, place where, like, you're not sure what the heck um, season it is because it's always kind of dark. Um, I don't know. It, the 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 locations they chose, while okay, were not really. It, like I said, they didn't mesh with the sets that they had for Amusement Mile and Founders Pier. You didn't feel like these were in the same world. Um, at all but that said otherwise it was really fine Um, I just wish that they had chosen some different um, on uh, you know on on location shooting uh, areas it just would have worked better Um, but like I said casting was great Uh, cinematography was good Uh, you had some Mostly the on-set filming was the best of the filming. You had a fair amount of control. You felt like it was actually happening in the world of Batman and, um, you know, Gotham City and everything like that. So you didn't feel quite so at odds. One thing that was lacking was an appearance from Batman. And I was watching. There wasn't Batman in the background. There wasn't Commissioner Gordon. There wasn't any stuff that we would actually feel comfortable with. There wasn't an appearance by Nightwing or Batgirl, which would have been a decent part of it. Instead, you just had uh, this all happening in a very small corner of Gotham, but somehow Batman, who's on top of everything all the time, wasn't in on this. And you know he would be, especially if someone was taking down Mafia bosses as in lethally. Um, So with that said, I'm going to give it a four out of five. It has a lot of good stuff to it. And uh, I think it really does um, hold up a little bit better than Suicide Squad. It has a lot of the same problems, uh, as I said, but it really does play out better than Joker, Suicide Squad, some of your other films. I still personally think that my fan-edited version of uh, Suicide Squad was immensely better. Uh, But besides all that, um, you know, it's a pretty solid film. Uh, It's from the school of thought that if you have female writers and directors telling a woman's story, then you get a better product. It worked with Wonder Woman, 100%. 
uh, we'll see in, I think it's June, uh, whether or not it will work with Wonder Woman 1984. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I hope you'll listen to uh, my review then. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for clicking onto here. If you want to, leave a constructive and respectful comment below. Uh, ding the bell, hit like, hit subscribe. You can follow me on social media like uh, Facebook and Twitter. I'm uh, also on Patreon and Cash App if you want to support my work, which I always will appreciate. Thanks a lot, and uh, take care. Bye.